Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Covenant Code series. It's January 27th, 2024, 10 a.m. Pacific time. And the subject this week is Tabernacle Prophecy of the Redemption of Jesus Christ. I want to um, say hello to everybody where you can watch this, this uh, broadcast live on uh, satellite, uh, Roku, YouTube. You can also uh, see uh, replays of it on, on uh, the BT YouTube channel. So, again, this is, uh, I think, number eight of the series so far. So, just to define what we're talking about to begin with. So, it's a, the tabernacle prophecy of the redemption of Jesus Christ. So, prophecy, as we've defined in the past, is the supernatural correct foretelling of a future event in advance of its occurrence. So basically telling history in advance. Redeemer really means buy back, to redeem or buy back from the old French redeemer or Latin redeemer. So from re, which is back, and emir, which is buy. So in modern terms, it's defined as when you say to redeem something, to gain or regain possession of something in exchange for payment. So, for example, when you redeem your mortgage or you can redeem a stock or whatever, but you get something back in exchange for a payment. It's also used sometimes you hear um, the word to comp compensate for a poor past <laughs> performance. So, for example, um, in sports, you might hear someone say, well, they redeemed themselves in the playoffs for their poor regular season play. You know, so anyway, it's 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 compensating for poor past performance. In ancient times, it was actually used uh, to define the payment for the freedom of a slave. So, you know, what what was the redemption price? Well, that was the price that was paid for that slave to be free. In biblical terms. Exodus 6, 6. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. So you see the definitions come, you know, tied together pretty much all in line. It's to, to buy back something, to buy back freedom. It, it costs something. But the object is that it's a, a, an active act to buy back freedom or to buy back the possession. The series Covenant Code is based on the book of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Where in that book, seven times it says it's a blessing for all who read, hear, keep or observe and obey the, the prophecy or, or the book. And in that book, in, in chapter 11, 1, there's instructions. So we, we're obeying and observing these instructions. We say, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and then that worship therein. So we've been doing that throughout the series. This week, we're talking about the temple itself as a prophetic, um, uh, as a prophecy of the redemption of Jesus. So we start off, and you can go back and look at other series if you want to review things, but in general, we start off talking about the covenant right at man's creation. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So we have to look at you know, what is in the image and likeness of God. Well, image is a rep representation of the external form of a person, the image of a person. Likeness is more eternal, uh, internal based. So likeness is the fact or quality of being alike, a resemblance. Her likeness to her father is striking. 
So when you think of the covenant summary, you know, that man would have dominion over all the earth while mankind walked together with each other and God in his likeness and in his image. And what's his likeness and image? Love, unity, truth. So covenants are for, for example, use of land, for marriage. So God coveted the earth for man. And it was his covenant. And that was, you know, that they could enjoy and um, man could walk together, dwell together in the image and likeness of God, in unity and truth, in love. So you think about it, immediately after their creation, the tabernacle always follows a covenant. Tabernacle means to dwell or dwelling. And you think of a covenant relationship like a marriage. And you think of you know what happens after you after you exchange those vows and you assemble together and you with, with, the, with the, the bridal party and, and you're at the altar and, and you know well now you get to leave that place and go dwell together. You're gonna now tabernacle together. After the covenant has been done, is the is the tabernacle in time. And you can see the little picture to the left. You know, the, looks like the groom can't wait to get out of there. At least the bride stops to say hi or, or bye-bye. But now it's time to tabernacle. This whole thing, all this ritual up to now, has all been prepared so we can dwell together. That's the whole point of it all. And so when we look at Adam and Eve, Adam says, this now is bone of bone and flesh in my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And we look what God did. Remember, man was created on the sixth day. So the very next day, on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. Everything he did to prepare this tabernacle for Adam and Eve, this dwelling place for for man, you know, all the all the taking chaos and creating order and creating life. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the se seventh day and sanctified it, which means set it apart. He set it apart for him and for man. Because in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So that's that first day together, they're able to dwell with each other and with God. The seventh day of the, of the creation of the week but the first day of their lives, really, you know. So, so like I said, you have a covenant. You have all the preparation for the covenant. God made the covenant, and now they get a chance to tabernacle to dwell together. Oops. And with covenants, there's often a warning or a restriction. For example. If you have a covenant on the land, it might be you can use this land except for you cannot chop down the trees in this quarter, or you can't do this, or you know, there's some restriction or something given into that that will um, not allow you anymore to you'll be outside of the covenant. You won't be able to use the land anymore. And so God was very clear with Adam of what this restriction or what this covenant was about, said the Lord. God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Put him in paradise. Said, here's, here's your life. Here's where you're going to dwell. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat it. For in the day that thou eat, uh, eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. When you, when you have the fruit that's on this one tree, it's it's the fruit of it's going to be sin. And sin is going to end up destroying you, your relationship with your wife, your relationship with me, and it's going to destroy this, this covenant. It's not going to, it's going to put you out of the covenant. It's not going to put God out of the covenant, but it's going to, it's going to, it's going to jeopardize this covenant. 
And when they did make the choice to eat of that fruit, the prophetic response from God to their deceiver, to their accuser, was he told them flat out, I will put enmity between thee, which is the, the deceiver, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. So this is the first prophecy that God would send his Christ, his anointed one. So it's God who gave this prophecy. God who told the deceiver face to face. And Adam and Eve overheard this judgment. Had they trusted the word of God, they never would have even tasted evil or its consequences. But having tasted evil, they will now be redeemed by their faith in the word of God. Do they trust now that God will send, will redeem them? Even though they've tasted of it now, now they have a choice. You fell into this situation because you didn't trust my word. But it's a covenant. And you will be redeemed by trusting in my word. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So he believed God. He believed when, that, that um, the seed of the woman would be the, the redeemer. And that's when he first called his wife Eve, the mother of all living. Even though they had heard the judgment that they themselves, as a consequence of the sin, would, would die. But that God would raise them up. That God would redeem them through their children. And not through anyone, so through the seed of the woman. And unto Adam also, and to his wife, did God make coats of skins and clothe them. So he covered their nakedness. And they were free and naked before but you remember the first thing that when they're hiding from God, is God says, who told you you were naked? Did you talk to that deceiver? But he covered their shame. And, you know, when we sin, sometimes the last thing we want to do is seek out God. We're ashamed. You know, we're promised that sin would do all this for us. Someone talked us into it. But now we've become a slave of that thing. We started smoking. We started taking drugs. We started the promise, because our friends said, oh, don't worry, it's great. We cheated on our wife, we cheated in business, we, we did something where we knew, that we, and the last thing we want to do at that time is, is see God. But God sought Adam out and Eve out and said, where are you? And then he entered them into this covenant. And so you can't enter into something that doesn't already exist. So he expanded that, showed them, look, at, and he covered them. And that's part of the covenant is, you know, he, he covered their shame. You know, in a covenant, the stronger is obliged to help the weaker. When they can't fulfill their end of the covenant, the first thing you have to do is try and help them fulfill their covenant, their end of the covenant. That's why in the marriage vow, it says, in better and worse, in, in sickness and in health, you're not supposed to abandon the person. You're supposed to, you know, if they don't want to, um, you know, be part of it anymore. You can't force them. But if they want to, if they, they've tasted this evil and they desire to the, get the relationship back, then that's what the covenant is, the, the redemption. I will, but it's gonna, but there's going to be a cost to it, obviously. That's why it says buy back, you know. They had basically forsaken their whole inheritance over to the accuser, the deceiver. And think of the position they were in now. Think of the position Satan was in. If God wanted to destroy all evil, all, he's now got a couple of body shields in Adam and Eve. He said, oh, you're going to destroy me, Christian? What about those two? I'm their accuser. They both sinned against you, so you have to destroy them too. And in his carnal mind, that's what his plan was. But he didn't understand the covenant. He didn't understand that God had already thought this through, that God had already prepared for 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 this with His Son, and that they were He wasn't. It was. It's not a, the worst thing about modern day preaching is they teach it like a contract. Though so these guys failed to live up to their end of the contract, therefore they were done. It was a covenant, you know. So long story short was, 
um, there was a restriction. It was pointed out to them. They breached that restriction. So they had an opportunity to, um, to, to have that corrected, to be back in the covenant. And that's the redemption. It was always about the seed of the woman. So regain possession for payment. Compensate for poor past uh, payment. The price for their freedom of a slave. So we first hear about, you know, where do those coats come from that he, that he clothed um, uh, Adam and Eve with? You know, from the, the an, an innocent animal, from a sacrificial animal. You know, so it cost a life. It cost, you know, it cost something. So when you're in a covenant, each party has to be represented in a covenant. And so in many um, uh, ancient covenants, it would, you know, what you had to have something on that covenant that represented you. And it was usually the blood of the testators, you know, they cut their thumb or, or whatever and, and put their blood on that covenant or something like their best of their flock, a, 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 an animal that would represent them. Because in those days, you know, the, the, the flock was the income. If you take the best of your of your flock and, and you sacrifice it, you know, that, that's very costly, you know. So anyway, long story short is that, that there was a cost to this and there was a representation here of, of each party. But how do you represent man and, and, and God in this? And um, so it was the blood of a sacrificial animal. And Adam, beginning with Adam, was made a mediator of the covenant. A mediator is someone that represents, you know, bring, brings the two parties together. So Adam could not sign with his own blood. He had fallen into temptation. This was this covenant was pointing forward to the one that would fulfill it, as God had already prophesied. So Adam was made a mediator. Later Noah, and then Abraham, and then Moses. If you look at each time, it's, for example, it says um, they built an altar to, to, to memorialize, you know, what God had done for them and them entering, you know, you know, re-entering the, the covenant on behalf of man. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal, some of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on that altar. Abraham. Then Abraham, then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your seed, I will give this land. So he built there an altar of the Lord who had appeared to him. And remember, it was the seed of the woman. The, the seed was, was a key word. Later, it says, this was Abraham when he brought his son Isaac. It says, when they came to the place which God told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. So God had, was testing Abraham. Remember that Adam, it says that, you know, Eve was deceived, but Adam sinned with eyes wide open. He, he clung to his flesh. He, he wasn't deceived. Eve was deceived, but he, you know, clung to her. Didn't trust how God would work it out. Abraham, on the other hand, when he was given a test to, you know, first of all, he's told that through his seed, through his son, the blessings will come, you know, through his own seed. The one thing that Abraham wanted was his own son, his own descendant. God gives him that son, his only son, and then God asks for him back. He says, take him to the certain place and give him back to me in the sacrifice. And Abraham didn't cling to his flesh. He was prepared to do it. But then God said, no, I will, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide the sacrifice. But since you've not withheld this from me, it will be your seed that's multiplied. And he, and he, he named that place when he had that altar, uh, Jehovah Jireh, which was God will provide. It says, they even called the name of that place, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide, as it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. 
And if we wonder where exactly that place is, most you know a lot of people know um, um, Christians of Sulaga, but we'll talk about that soon here too. But I'm just trying to get to the point of that these altars were all pre temple, pre tabernacle. They were they were built. They, they they had to be you know simple, no hewn stones, just between man and God, and renewing the covenant. Abraham had been called out of the land of adultery. So I want to show there's two seeds. There was the seed through Adam and through his descendants, and then the seed through Cain. And remember that um, that Cain and Abel both brought a sacrifice to the Lord. But Cain brought an inappropriate sacrifice, brought one of his own you know, the work of his own hands. He, 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 he didn't bring what he was asked or what he was required. And Abel did. And so Cain, out of jealousy, killed Abel. And when Cain was banished, you know, it was sent east, whatever, then along with him and along with his descendants, and later on, uh, we'll get more into it later on, but anyway, began what's, you know, the, the pagan mystery religions. There's a term called mimesis. You think of a mind. You think of a, you know, what we know as a modern mind. You know that that they're silent, but they imitate, and that's what really, really it is. Is that when they go to build these pagan monuments, pagan uh, uh, temples, so that they're imitating. You know, they're trying to bring God down to earth. And imitating, you know, heaven on earth, and imitating that they're the chosen ones, but their gods are silent. Their gods are minds. They're, they're just occult trickery. You know, they're the the ones that benefit are the are the uh, high priests and the people that know what's going on. So, for example, they their observations of the of, of the celestial bodies. They like they know where the sun is going to shine. You know, on the winter or summer solace or or uh, 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 when an eclipse is going to happen, and they structure their buildings in a way almost like an astronomical clock so that at a certain time, that they already know it's gonna, the sun's going to shine there, but to wow the people and deceive the people, the sun shines on that, or, the, or a star shines on that spot at this time of every year where they call together their worship. So it's, it's imitation prophecy. It's imitation everything. They, they, they venerate nature. Um, polytheism, you know, polytheism is usually at least you know more than one god. There's always a goddess. Um, they always somehow tie into their ancestors, you know, to be uh, you know, in, in through these gods. And they do these rituals to appease you know the angry gods, but also to appease the initiates. The initiates. And, and and how do they do it through orgies and human sacrifice and indulgence? So I'm pointing out this right now that there's there was never any redeeming value in any of these pagan worship sites. There was never ever intended to be any redeeming value. They were man-made and imitations, and they the gods were silent. It was just all trickery. The, the difference between that and, and the altar and and the sacrifice and what we've been talking about up to here, there's always, always redemption at the end. The, the whole objective of it was it had redeeming value. So Moses was the final mediator of the covenant, of the old covenant. He was called by God to lead his brethren out of Egyptian slavery and adultery. And uh, I'm just sorry, I'm going to move one thing here. And the, this whole nation of Israel entered into this covenant at Mount Sinai. And we went through a little bit of that before. But through this time, a pattern was given for the tabernacle. 
so this 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 tabernacle is the tabernacle of the covenant with God, and it, a very clear picture was was given, and a and a and a proper way of worship was was um, ordained. In fact, Moses was told, you know, three times not to deviate from this pattern, and it had to do with the, the whole thing, the the structure, the ways and days of of, of um, worship of, of observance. They're all very specific, on a specific day, specific way of worship. And remember when we were instructed in Revelations 11, 1, we're to go back and look at those days and look at those ways and look at the structure to see um, the un, uh, unobstructed pattern. And one of the first things we note is that the entrance gate was on the east side, which is unlike the pagan temples. So the most holy place was on the west side. So worshipers would have their backs to the sun during their worship observation. They're looking towards the west. And, and the, when the sun rises in the east, their back is to the east. Opposite of, of these you know, um, uh, pagan temples. I want to show you something here. So we talked about Abraham and that God would provide the sacrifice. And the very spot that Abraham was led to go to is where the temple ended up being built in Jerusalem. And that spot um, still remains today, although the temple was destroyed. But on the Passover day, which is the, the, the first, when they led him out of, out of slavery, the, the first feast that was given was, was the Passover and along with the Sabbath. But on that Passover day, the sun rises over the highest point of the Mount of Olives, right at magnetic due east, straight on line. If you put a pole between there, it would, it would, it would block your, block the, uh, it would be like an eclipse right to that spot where Abraham was led, right at that time of year is when the sun is from two east. These other two blue arrows here, there's a variance between the winter and summer solace where the sun rises 50 degrees one way or the other, um, either northeast or southeast. But to be due east is right at this time. And you got to remember that this is a thousand, you know, when when Moses was given these instructions and built this tabernacle, it was a thousand years before there was magnetic compasses, you know. So, but somehow, you know, they knew exactly how to orientate it. And to this day, it's a witness that that's the spot that that where where um, the Lord said God will provide the sacrifice, and that's the spot that the temple was chosen to be built at and it's you know the sun rises due east um this is the westerly wall on the bottom so this is from the west looking, looking east at sunrise at passover we talked in earlier um uh, earlier in the series that the covenants distinguished from an ordinary contract by the presence of a seal the sealing was done by the closing of the document, sealing it in blood, and imprinting it with a metal seal or a signet ring. Um, and then the document could not be opened without breaking the seal. You know, the whole idea of the of the wedding bands, you know, in, in a marriage covenant is is a signet ring. But anyway, so in this pattern. Moses is instructed, and people are instructed, that these tablets of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, be put inside that ark, and that it be covered with this mercy seat, with the two cherubims looking towards each other and looking towards the, the seat. Um, and this place we talked about before could only be entered on the most holy day of the year, by, in, in it was in the most holy place of the tabernacle, the far west end of the tabernacle. 
and it could only be anointed by the most holy, the, the anointed high priest. And we saw before in our earlier studies that only the blood of Jesus, which is the seal that, that was sprinkled, the blood that was sprinkled on that mercy seat, only the blood of Jesus could equally represent both God and man. He was the son of God, and through the woman, the son of man. He was the seed of the woman, and the atonement, the redeemer. The when you talk about atonement, it means the at one moment. Um, but if I'm going to, um, uh, if my daughter has an accident, car accident, atonement is an active thing. I, I can go to the person that she, you know, drove into and and say, "I'm sorry, my my daughter accidentally hit your car. I um, I'm going to atone for that. I'd like to atone for that for her. I want her free of any debt or any worry or concern." Here's a check, you know, we don't have to go through insurance or here's my insurance or whatever. But it's an act. Of, an act. It's the same as redemption, basically. It's, it's just, they're both active. They're active. You know, so this this arc represents where this covenant is sealed and how it's sealed. And it's sealed by the blood of the sacrifice. But when Jesus, you know, was with his disciples, he said, this is my blood. This represents, you know, my blood of, of the new covenant. It's the same covenant. The difference is that Jesus isn't a mediator in the fact that um, that he represents only one side. He alone represents God and man equally, and through him, God and man come to agreement of the value of this redemption, and so. It's, you know, this is what this whole, you know, arc, you know, uh, foretold. And this is, from the beginning, God is the one that said, I will send my son. I will send, he didn't say it in those words at the time, it got more and more uh, revelation, but I will send the Redeemer. And remember he said, he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. He, he would pay for it. It would be a consequence of stomping on the head of a serpent. And that consequence was his death. But through the foretelling and the, and, the, and the power of God, his resurrection was a sign of the redemption, a sign of the acceptable sacrifice. So when we get into that more later on, but but anyway, so this this is what these you know covenants and, and altars, the blood that would seal that covenant on that mercy seat had to come from the altar. And that altar was the blood of the seed of the woman and had to be brought into the most holy place. The most holy place had no windows or enter no, no provision for outside light. It wasn't reliant on man-made occult astronomical verification. It didn't foretell the rising of the sun on some certain day, shining on some phony God. It was the rising of the Son of God in fulfillment of his word and man's redemption. So just as on his crucifixion, the temple, the veil of the temple, that, that veiled the, the most holy place, veiled that ark, it tore in half at his crucifixion. And on his resurrection, that tombstone, that sealed tombstone, was rolled back. So, yeah, that that and that. Remember, that was a Passover. That was when that when the the sun was due east, and that sunrise, you know, <laughs> the the light would have shone on an empty tomb. You know, because he is risen. We looked previously in the series about how prophetic that act was and, and how we noticed that this mercy seat, which talked about and, and was purposed for that atonement, how its dimensions were given, you know, 1.5 by 2.5, and how when we compared everyone from Adam to the Ark of Noah, that was 1,656 years, so the Ark was, you know, 1,656 years, the time from the Ark to Jesus 
was the to his baptism was exactly 1.5 times that. So 1656 times 1 1.5 was 2,484 years. And the total length from Adam to Jesus was 2.5 times that. So 1656 times 2.5 was 4140. We spent quite a bit of time talking about this in, in the past, this relationship with the ark and with actual time and observed time, and how it's all about this redemption promised to Adam and Eve and, and reinstated by Noah, Noah and Abraham and Moses. And we looked, I don't bring those charts up right now, but we looked at Moses when he was born and exactly when that was, et cetera. Time we have here, and we did a little bit of uh, looking at the soft materials um, in the, the tabernacle. But I want to spend a little bit of time on on two things. They're both in Exodus twenty six, and that's when when Moses was being given the instructions for building a tabernacle. And there's two things that are given in Exodus twenty six. One is the inside covering or really the the, the ceiling the, the 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 special curtain embroidered curtain that forms the ceiling of the uh, the, the, the you know the ceiling or the covering of the tabernacle so if you're inside and you're looking up this is what you would see and the other thing that's in exodus 26 is the walls the the, the tabernacle boards that make the outside you know the, the walls so when you're inside you see these gold boards as the wall. So I want to talk about those two things for a minute. First of all, we'll talk about the soft materials. And this is the instructions that were given. Thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen, blue, purple, scarlet, with cherubim of cutting work shall, shall they make them. Remember that when, when we hear Adam you know, being banished from the garden, the at the east end of that garden, we put two, you know, cherubim to guard the way back in, guard the way of light. And this same color of decoration of, of linen was used for the, not only the inside covering, but also the two veils of the of, of the uh, separating the the holy place and most holy place, and the gate, the eastern gate, to come in into there. So. There, so this material is, is the same. Um, and so it's have the, the length of one shall shall be eight and twenty cubits, so it's be twenty eight cubits long, and the breadth of one four cubits long, and everyone will have one measure, so twenty eight by four. And then five of them should be coupled together, and then the other five should be coupled together to hold one or the other. So in total, there'll be ten curtains all linked together to make one. And each one is 28 by 4 times 10. So it says, and, and then to make 15 times of cold and couple the curtains together and it should be one tabernacle. So that, that's the covering for the, the entire tabernacle. And we spoke before, and I was, I was talking about the you know the color of these gates, and and you know how see how this one gate the same type of thing with the purple and the scarlet and the cherubim, and and Paul talked about um, our our way into the most holy place, and, and said by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say through his flesh. So these. When you see these veils, these you know, separating the holy and most holy place, and, and the, even the front gate to the east, and the covering of the of the whole tabernacle, it all represents his flesh, the, the acts of Jesus, and 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 the, our access then to God through through this. When he was talking to his disciples, uh, he said, uh, "You know where I'm going. This is you know on, on the eve of his crucifixion." Where I'm going, you will not be able to follow me right now, and but you will, you know, you will later. And they said, "Well, how can we follow you if we don't know the way?" And Jesus said unto them, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
no man comes unto the Father but by me. It's through Jesus. He's he's the seed, the redeemer. You know, that's how he's you know, he's the whole object of the whole covenant. In another quote there from Leviticus, um, and he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. So we noticed before, when we add up all those soft materials, we, we talked about each one, the, the white linen, the gates, everything else. We added them up before, and it was 4,140 altogether, which is, again, exactly the same amount of years from Adam to, to Jesus. But right now, I want to focus just on this 1120, on this covering of the, of the tabernacle. So it's 28 by 4, which is 112 times 10. So the total is 1120 for that covering of the tabernacle. And I want to compare that to Isaac, the son of the promise. Remember when Abraham, it's Isaac that he bound. And the Lord said, no, I will provide the sacrifice, you know, but because you would not withhold your son, your only son, you know, I, I will bless you. And God didn't withhold his son, his only son. And from the birth of Isaac to when the temple was actually consecrated and put to use, so after the tabernacle, there's a permanent temple, is exactly 1,120 years. And I want to compare this because we've talked about the times of the Lord and observed times. Look at the way it was given, 28 by 4 by 10. So 28 hours times 4 is 112 hours. So that's 4.666 days. 112 divided by 4, 24 is 466. Times 10 would be 46.666. And I'll point that out now so I can show you something with the tabernacle boards. So the instructions for the tabernacle boards, again, given in Exodus 26. And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of shit and wood, Standing up. Notice it said the boards are standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board. A cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one board. Two tenons, and sometimes um, in some versions it says two feet, shall it be on one board, set in one other against another. So if you look at these two, uh, this board here at the bottom, you see these two tenons or, or uh, two you know, feet or whatever. And here is these silver sockets we're about to describe. These sockets were very heavy, it was made of you know, pure silver. But the origin of these sockets, everything that was made from silver, was from the redemption money. Remember, they were, uh, they were asked to give a silver shekel for the firstborn of, 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 of everyone of, you know, of, of, of the tribes. Uh, and that silver was put to use in making the, the tabernacle. And outside of that these feet for these boards, there is no silver in, in in the holy place, the most holy place. It's all gold. But these boards are standing on the feet of redemption. They're standing on the silver. So and that should make boards comes down 20 boards on the south side. That should make 40 sockets. So these sockets you know, are of silver under the 20 boards. So there's two for each one because you got to put one you know left and a right into the socket. 40 sockets of silver, two sockets sockets under one board for, and notice how it says, for his two tenons, and two sockets another board for his two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, so you know, we go south, north, remember west is the most holy place, east is towards the gate. So over here, you can kind of see this, you know, this, this diagram, you see these on, on this one side here, that's that's 20 boards, you know, on the south, 20 on the north, and then it's talking about, um, and on the, um, and for the sides of the tabernacle, westward, so that's towards the most holy, that should make six boards, and then two boards shall make the corner of the tabernacle, so six boards on this side, 
and then two corner boards. Let's see how much time I have here. So much time I get into this. Okay, so just kind of stick with me on this a little bit. So there's 46 that we were, we were talked about. 20 on one side, 20 on the other, six in here, and then there's two corner boards, which we'll talk about in a minute. But each one, so it's 46 times 1.5. So 46 and 1.5 is 69. And when we use they as our measuring rod, they don't just, they don't, what do you measure? We're measuring time now. So when we use they, we could go 69 times 24 is 1656. Remember, in the Bible, it says in the days of Noah, in the day of Enoch, and day of... So we're just using literal time to measure that. So if you, if you take... You know, these boards alone times 1.5 times 24 hours, you get 1656. Then you just take the same dimensions of the mercy seat times 1.5 is 2484, times 2.5 is 4140. And again, we have you know, Adam to the ark, ark to Noah, length to Adam to Jesus. But we also talked about prophetic years versus observed years. I just want to cover this for a second. But what about the two corner boards? We know that the, the inside dimension was always given as it's 10 by 10 by 10 square. Well, 6 times 1.5 is only 9. So how can it be 6 on one side and have an inside dimension of 10? Well, if you look at the way I've kind of configured it here on, on the left, if if these corner boards, the two corner boards are put in like this, so that a third of that board is inside the tabernacle and two thirds are outside, then what you have is six boards plus you know, a third, which is 0 0.3333. And then you have the same thing on the other side. You have six boards plus a third. So you really have um, 6.6666. And 6.666 times 1.5 is 10. So that's where you get the dimension. And I also talked to you before, and we spoke about the difference between a prophetic year and an observed year. And we noted that every 69 observed years equals 70 prophetic years. So there's an extra over five days per year in an observed solar year versus a 360-day prophetic year. So, and I'm trying not to, you know, hit you with a flood, but we spent seven hours up to now talking about this, so you can always go back and, and review. But so now let's look at it. Each is 1.5 wide. So 46.66 times 1.5 is 70. And do the same thing with days as our measurement. 70 times 24 is 1680. Well, guess what? 28 hours, remember 28 times 4, times 60 minutes is 1680 minutes. The mercy seat times 1.5 equals 1680 times 1.5 is 2520. Mercy seat length times 2.5 is 4200. Just like 2520 is how many prophetic years there are in 2484 observed year. And 4200 prophetic years are how many years are in 4140 observed years. Now here's something that might be more interesting than all. Remember the tabernacle covering is 1120. So let's make it really simple. Just take these dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant. First dimension is 1.5. 1 1.5 1 times 1120 is 1680. The same prophetic years as the time of the flood. Where do we get 2.25 from? Well, it's easy. 1 1.5 times 1 1.5 because the height is 1.5 as well. So 1.5 times 1.5 times 1. Times 1120 is 2520, exactly the amount of prophetic years there are between the flood and the baptism of Jesus. And 3.75, where do you get that from? Well, times 1.5 by 2.5, the dimensions of the mercy seat. 3.75 times 1120 is 4200. See, all these things all work together, all are in the tabernacle that was built. 1400 years before Jesus was born, 
3,500 years ago. It was all part of this original pattern given to Moses at the time of the covenant. So we would be able to observe it and understand and foresee what it was foretelling. When Jesus was accused and, and brought to trial for blasphemy, then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign shall you show us, seeing that thou does these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years has this temple been rebuilt. So they had been rebuilding the temple. And will thou raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. This temple, this tabernacle, is a personification of Jesus and vice versa. It's all about telling the act of redemption that God would accomplish through him. Wherefore, when he come into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wilt not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. Then said I, Lo, behold, in the volume of the book it is written of me, everything we read from Genesis to here, to do thy will, O God, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So let's just look at that number one more time, 46666. Well, 46666 divided by 6 is 7777. 46666 divided by 7 is 666666. So you see this reconciliation between the 6th and the 7th, how God planned for a very specific time. The boards are the redeemed generations. Just as the sixth generation was born 460 years from Adam, and the seventh, which was Enoch, who never tasted death, was born after 621 years. So 4140, the time of the baptism, divided by the seventh generation, 621, is 66666. Let's see, 4140 divided by seven, six. It's the seventh generation. 4200, which are the same prophetic years, Divided by 630, which is the same amount of time of prophetic years, is also 66666. So these boards represent the redeemed generations. The ark represents the act of redemption. And the covering over top represents the result of the redemption. You know, Jesus went to heaven to present his blood after he arose. And when he returns, the covenant is you know, fulfilled. And, and well, we'll get into that later on. When Jesus came to, in fulfillment of this prophecy, in fulfillment of all the pro prophets and this tabernacle, he entered through the east gate. And the people recognized their Messiah, their anointed they sang hallelujah, they bowed down, they knew that he was the anointed one. Despite the ignorance of the religious leaders, but when he entered that day, he went through the East Gate, and what he did was, the first thing he did was he went and visited that temple. And he came back the next morning, and he turned over all of the, the money changers' tables, all of the all the corruption inside there that had been denigrated to. He said, my father's house must be a house of prayer. You made a den of thieves. They're bringing in these pagan, and, and I mean, they're trying to rip off people, just like the whole pagan system, you know, does. But he turned that over, and he, you know, the whole, the, in the most holy place of that temple that he was in, the one most holy place that was the Ark of the Covenant. And here it predicted when he would come. And here he was standing at that very temple and the very you know, week of his passion. So, and he said, see this temple? Not one stone will be left upon the other. And after his crucifixion and resurrection, 
as he's warned and as he foretold, the temple was destroyed. The ark was gone. Everything it was it was pointing towards him. Once he came, it was destroyed and it's never been rebuilt. Although several attempts have been made to do it, so the earthly temple was destroyed according to his word, but the heavenly temple, what it all pointed towards, was raised up on the third day, just as he foretold. So when we talk about prophecy, foretelling the future in advance of its occurrence, and we talk about the Redeemer or redemption, and how this tabernacle prophesizes of the redemption of Christ, it's not you know, what part of it does, all of it does. The whole thing from the altar all the way through. We're only just taking a little look at it, you know, right? We're just skimming the surface, the first presentations here. But the deeper we look, the more we see. And we see that this is from the Lord. This is supernatural. You know, telling the future in advance of its occurrence is supernatural. And it can deny the truth, but it doesn't change the truth. So what happened, pagan, imitation, temples, everything else, were all destroyed by the gospel of Christ. Once the gospel came, all those imitations were gone. And we're told, you know, these you know, lies today that, um, oh, well, there was lots of gods and then it became, man became more reasonable and more knowledgeable. Then it came down to one God, and that's why the other temples disappeared. But, you know, that's just another, they just they just borrowed all everything from the Hebrew, was borrowed from the ones before them, because the other ones, the other temples were older, and they came beforehand, and blah, blah, blah. And it's just not true. In fact, Egyptologists, Egyptologists and archaeologists, the further they go back and find things, the fewer gods they find in these pagan temples because those gods just kept getting added to and adding to and adding to. You know, they're all, it was all ancestor worship and whatever. It wasn't because man became more reasonable and because it just told oh, there must be, just be one God. From the beginning, it was one God. The man went a buck. All this imitation and trying to create heaven on earth and trying to create these rituals and whatever, it became out of hand. And it became oppressive, and it became usury. And when the gospel was told, when 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 Jesus came in fulfillment, that's when those temples were all destroyed and abandoned. That's when those religions were gone. So you see today this 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 um, pining and this um, this uh, desire to go back to this pagan religions because they have so much wisdom and so they have no redeeming value. And that's one thing to keep in mind. They never did. They never will have any redeeming value. Only this temple, this tabernacle, from the outset, from the very beginning, had a redeeming value. And once that redemption became reality, the temple was not of any more use. So that's my time for today. Just hit it right on time. Thank, thank goodness. So I'm going to um, do the stop sharing and uh, I'll come back for some questions. But thank you again um, for, for your time. And I hope it was a blessing for you. Thank you. That was uh, another good one. So I'll come back in about five, ten minutes, but I want to let Dean be able to go ahead. I'm sure he's probably ready. All right. I'm going to take it off and put it back on. So hang on, Dean. Okay. So I'm just going to mute myself, and then I'll come on to watch Dean. Okay. And hello, Carol. Glad to have you here. Yes. Welcome back, Carol. You're muted. <laughs> hello, Carol. Yeah, it's good to You're see muted, you. Carol. We can't hear Carol, you. 